Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host this afternoon. And with me, of course, is my yellow and lovely player, Haley. <gasps> Hi, guys. How you doing today? I forgot my wife, though. You're not my wife today, I guess. Oh, okay. Who am I? Just some lady I found Just... li- living in my house. Yeah. Oh, so so I'm like a ghost. Am I a ghost or I'm like no. those strange squatters that like live in the attic? That one. Ooh. That one, except I wasn't in the attic because it's too hot outside. <laughs> That's why you never found me. <laughs> exactly. It took you, so long. Have you seen those stories? People like have someone living in their attic for years and not even yeah. realize it. It's creepy. It's so eerie and creepy and like unsettling. Dude, we can only hope. I bet they would have so many stories. I'm sure they're terrifying stories too. I mean, that, that would be so interesting. Like, what did you see? How long have you lived there? How did you do it? Take me with you. <laughs> well, hello and welcome to the Malt House Games podcast. As I said, my name is Delton. This is my wife, Haley, and we are a board game, tabletop game, role playing game, card game, dice game podcast. We also like to talk about beer, and that is what we do here. So I'm going to crack the first beer coming off of that squatter talk. So this is uh, from Elysian Brewing. Isn't that the brew company, I believe? Yes. Yes. El- Elysian Brewing, which is from. It looks like they have a couple, Seattle and uh, Tempe, Arizona. They have uh, Super Fuzz, a blood, blood orange pale. I cannot talk today. It says, Grok this. What if the world were an orange, a blood orange, and the O's has the peace sign in it, with hop cones orbiting around it, and it's all like an atom, ale brewed with blood orange. There you go, which is kind of hilarious. Looking for an alcohol percentage. I had to look it up on, what what is it? 6. Untapped? 4. Dang it. You saw it on there. I, I couldn't find it on there. Well, I guess I couldn't find it on the box when I bought it. Yeah. They're in like a cardboard box, and I could not find it. So I looked on the uh, beer guide before this podcast. Like, I'm going to know it, and Delton doesn't. And then Delton found it on the can. So I now, found foiled. It. Found it on the can. Foiled. As always, we'll have pictures of these in our little advertisement. I do like the can a lot. It's very much a... Think of like a 60s uh, undercover cop movie, but then make it more psychedelic. It looks very Hendrix-esque. Very Hendrix-esque, but uh, has like the aviators and a bunch of pinks and yellows, and it's bright and pretty. So let's give this one a nice smell. Mm. It smells very good and light. You can smell some of the orange in there. It's light and orangey and hoppy, so it smells like to me. Definitely, you you do get the aroma hops there. It's Whoa. very cloudy with a lot of sediment. Well, I'd say, look at that sediment, man. So, it looks like a lava lamp. It isn't unfiltered, so I tipped it to make sure everything kind of mixes through. Because is this wild. is going to be like orange pulp and stuff. So if it's kind of grody because of that, I'm sorry, but it's going to happen. And I'd rather us both get some than just the person who got the last bit. Sounds great. Mm. Ooh, that's really good. Ooh. It has a very, um, I mean. It's sweet. It's called Super Fuzz, but it has like a, not silky, like a velvety, a velvety mouthfeel to it. Yes, it does. But the aftertaste is really sweet. Like whenever you, you have like a navel orange, mm-hmm. like that doesn't have a lot of the white, what, what is the white stuff called? Pulp. Pulp. Yeah. Like the inside of the rind. Yeah. the doesn't have a lot of the pulp innards, the white innards in an orange, like the really sweet navel oranges. That's what this tastes like. Very it's really, juicy. It's really good. Mm-hmm. It's foamy on the back end. When you swallow, you still kind of get a mouth of foam, so I can tell it's going to mess with my speech. But you don't feel a lot of that sediment in there. No, you don't. It's very, very good. Delicioso. Mm-hmm. Because it's super, super hazy. You can't see through it. It's got a nice crispness, but then a softness that it finishes with that sweet. That's a really good beer. I really like that. Same here. A plus, Elysian. There you go. Do you want to hear my thought process in buying this beer? Go ahead. Not really in buying the beer, but coming back. Yeah. So I like to walk. Like going for walks, I've really been into since the whole plague has happened. For example, uh, today my car hit empty and I haven't filled up my car with gas since April. That's only because Delton borrowed my car for a week to go to work. Yep. So I like to walk. We have a liquor store right by our house and it's only about a half mile away whenever you're walking. And so I typically, I will, I will walk there whenever I want to get something. Well, last night, it was about 8.45, 9 o'clock at night whenever I'm walking back, so it's getting dark. And I've been doing jujitsu with Brian on Saturdays. 
And so I'm walking back and I don't know if it is a, I'm paranoid, I have anxiety, or I'm just a small female, but I've always in my life, whenever I'm walking by myself, um, I don't know if it's because I live by myself for so long too, or I had to walk uh, back home after night classes a lot, but I always run through my head, like, what would I do if I were attacked? You know, would I use my keys? Would I use my fists? And so last night I was walking back and I was thinking about what jujitsu would I use? But then I was like, oh, what would I do with the beer? What would I do? And like, I walked by a tree and I'm like, I, I could throw the, throw the beer into this bush and I can attack my attacker back and then I can get my beer and go home. So I really thought about it for you guys saving this beer if I were attacked. All of our lovely viewers are thankful that you thought of them and maintaining our two beers an episode as best we can. Aye, aye. All for you. <laughs> so what's been going on this week? I've finally built my keyboard. I'm very excited about. I did that this week. I got my final piece in and was able to put it together and have been using it and absolutely love the sound. It feels great. It looks good. Uh, I will get different keycaps next year that I have ordered on a group buy, which is kind of like a Kickstarter. Uh, I'll be getting those next year. They're going to be a higher quality, more premium, and also a color, uh, color setting, color palette, I guess, that I really prefer. It's based on bread, which I think is great because I like to bake. But very, very happy with my keyboard. Super excited about that. So that's really been the highlight of my week this week. Y'all know what mine is. Mushrooms. Mushrooms. So I have been trying to grow mushrooms from grocery store mushrooms. I'm trying to grow portobello mushrooms, not the psychedelic mushrooms that everyone online keeps saying. <laughs> Psychedelics. No, I want portobellos. I like to eat portobellos in my fettuccine. And so I've been trying, I've been, I use four different sporing methods that I found on the internet. So far, two of the sporing methods have produced mushrooms. Now they look like little bitty mushrooms under the sea right now, but every time they die off, then a whole new round of bigger mushrooms comes. So I think we're eventually going to get some portobellos that are full and ready to eat. I don't really know. This has all been an adventure. But anyway, I spored mushrooms, produced mycelium, and grew mushrooms in my cabinet. Boom, you did it. I did it. It has been fun to watch them prop, spot, uh, I can't speak at all today, to pop up and sprout those little bitty mushrooms, turn to those big things, then die, and then just a bunch more come up. It's like been an eight-hour process. Like some will pop up and die, pop up bigger, then die, pop up bigger, then die. And so eventually, hopefully, we'll get some portobellos that are big enough to eat, but this is wild. Yeah, because I don't know what kind of mushroom things those are. I, I, the only mushroom spores <laughs> that I had were portobello, so I hope it's just portobello. Yeah. It might just be some weird thing, and who knows? Maybe there's something in the air that got in there, because uh, who knows how that works out. But just in case the government is listening, if they're not portobello, I can't recognize them. We're not going to try no, them. No, if the, if, they're, if it's not very obvious what they are, I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> no, they are going to go... I don't know, in the in the garbage. Yeah, that's rule number one with mushrooms. I can't, I, I don't want to hallucinate or die. Check. Or get diarrhea. Yeah, I don't want that either. All of those sound terrible, but I at least know that I can produce mushroom spores. Boom. Or I don't produce them, but I propagate them. It'd be really cool if I could produce mushroom spores. Like, bing, 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 it's my superpower. You would never starve. <laughs> I would never starve. <laughs> it would be so exciting. I feel like this has been a really wild uh, banter so far today. It's been a very strange banter, but I think it's because we are, I don't know. Excited. We're excited about the game for the episode, and it's the weekend. So we have good energy, but we're all over the place with it. We have to focus. <laughs> so ready, focus. Three, two, one, go game. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's, it's a game. So today, we are actually talking about a game, reviewing a game that is a review copy. So this game was sent to us thanks to Hub Games. They sent it to us to hear our thoughts and review. So thank you, Hub Games, for sending this to us to take a look at. The game today is Adventure Mart, which is their newest release. It is currently out. You are able to purchase this game from their website, which I would highly recommend purchasing directly from them because they have been a great group of folks. And uh, you should support them. I think it's only 35 I think it's 30 or $35. So uh, it's great. It's a good price. I say go buy it from their website. So Adventure Mart. Adventure Mart is a 
deck building like store management game that's based around a lot of cards. The game is designed by Sam Taylor. The illustrations are Monique Schilder, Stephanie Bolin. Sensitivity reviewer was Calvin Wong. Developed by Digisprite. Additional development by Hub Games. The graphic design was Winnie Sheck, which you will recognize her name from Holding On. And the project management is Emma Goody and Aaron Granbury. You say Calvin. Calvin is the sensitivity like consultant for this game. Hi, Calvin. Calvin's great. If you guys have seen Crazy Rich Asians, Calvin had a role in that movie. He's also an avid board game fan, and I believe he's also been hired by Fantasy Flight to help create some of the like story and stuff for Twilight Imperium. Yes, and he's a great activist too. He really is. He seems to be a very genuine, genuine and great person. So that's really cool. I'm glad he got to help out with this. So Adventure Mart, as I said before, it is a deck building slash like store management game. The way this game is going to work is you have a couple different types of cards you'll be collecting and adding to either your deck, which is your storeroom, or your store itself, which are going to be staff and fixtures. What you're doing is you're collecting different stock from the stock deck to put in your storeroom. Those are going to be the cards you draw. And you will be using those cards to make offers to the different adventurers that are coming in. So you play a manager of an adventure mart. I think I'm going to read the front of this rule booklet to really give a better overview. It says, hello, managers. Welcome to Adventure Mart, the greatest chain of convenience stores in the multiverse. I'm Hank, which is the really cute, like, little dragon guy, our corporate mascot, and I'm here to help you be the best manager in town. Adventure Mart stores are magically summoned to wherever they are needed. Locations often have more than one store, so you're sure to have some healthy competition. Our draconic board at Amart HQ encourage adventure capitalism as competition drives the best profits for everyone. So you are a manager of an Adventure Mart store and you are trying to compete against the other players who are managers of their own stores to get these adventurers to come purchase from you. I finally figured out why I have such an advantage in this game. Why? It's in my blood. It is in your blood. Because my great-great-grandfather owned a grocery store, and guess what his name was? Hmm. Hank. Was it really? Yes. All right, there you go. It's so that's de- why I kick ass in this game, guys. It's in my blood. It is <laughs> destined to be. So the way the game is going to work is on your turn. You may either use a card ability. Uh, the cards will have different abilities on them. Some of them you can utilize on your turn, which have a little tag in blue that says use. So you can use a card ability, which can, uh, one of my favorites, allows you to take two more turns that, that turn, two more actions, I should say. One of them allows you to banish a card from your hand, which means it goes away from the game forever. And then you draw three from your storeroom, so you fill your hand up. So you can use those use abilities, or you may purchase something out on the table. You can either purchase from the... Uh, cards that are different stock to put in your store. You can purchase some staff, basically hire some staff to work your store, which they give you other usabilities and different bonuses. And then you can also purchase fixtures for your store, which is like a slushy fountain. And there was like a tree and a scrying pool and all these little things that help you do stuff throughout the game, whether it's giving you discounts on cards, letting you look at the top of decks and letting you alter the way you sell stuff. On your turn, you may also, and this is the critical point to the game, you may make an offer to an adventurer. So each round, there is a number of adventurers set face down, so you cannot see them. You pick one randomly, because of course you can't see who's going to walk into your store. You don't choose that when you own a store. That person walks into your store, and you now make an offer based on the quality, which is dictated by the stars on cards, you make an offer based on the quality of the items they want. So there are red items for fighters, blue items for mages, and green items for like the ranger types. So each adventurer wants certain types of items and you have to offer with those. It then now becomes a bidding war where you make an offer and then the next player in turn order has to try to have a higher offer than you if they want to win that adventurer. Once somebody has the highest offer and everybody else backs out or can't play any more cards toward it, they win it, and based on how much money the adventurer has and how much value the cards you've offered to him are worth, you may make money off of that adventurer. And that's going to be the basics of how the game's going to function. You're going to buy some cards that either sit out in your store to help you, staff to utilize, cards to go into your storeroom that you use as offers, 
and then you're going going to try to win by selling the most, making money, using that money to reinvest in your store and have the highest total essential value in your store versus every other player. I hope that makes sense. It's a little strange to explain. I've said that a lot with games anymore. But basically, you have cards in your hand, up to four cards in front of you, which are st staff and fixtures, and then you will keep buying cards and try to sell to these adventurers. I really like this game a lot because of the theme. A lot of times you get that uh, fantasy theme, and it's it's the same thing. Like you are a mage going on a quest, or you are a ranger going on a quest, and there's fighting, and there are adventures to be had. And this one, it's a fantasy theme. Like you have your mages, you have your rangers, you have your uh, tools, you have your magical items, but you have to get them at the grocery store. It is such an adorable way to have this theme. It's, you know, it is the fantasy side, which we've kind of talked about theme before and yeah. how much, you know, fantasy is often a deterrent. But this one is like the cutest, most inviting and welcoming fantasy theme I have seen. It is. It's bright. It's colorful. It really catches the eye. Some of the fixtures. So there's the public scrying pool that lets you look at some cards, add one to your hand kind of thing. You have the town cartograph. You have banishing uh, transmutation station to banish something from your hand. You've got the bonsai of knowledge was the tree I was thinking of where you get to look at the top of the deck. The aether slush fountain. It adds this fantasy element to these adorable things and everyday things in terms of the fixtures, which I find fun. Some of the staff. Uh, one of your favorites, Haley, is uh, Eloria the Overqualified. She's basically like a nymph or a, um, I can't think of what they are, like a tree person kind of thing. Uh, looks like very leafy. And she basically makes a card that you're trying to offer become the type that you want it to be. She tricks people. You have Mini Beans the Vandal Artist, which is a cute cat that basically vandalizes your opponent's store as its action. You have the Red Mountain Bard, which is some kind of like goat bard playing a bagpipe. That's a kitty. That's not a kitty. He's no. got horns. Those are kitty ears. Here's his ear. Oh. Those are horns. He's like a goat. Well, hell's bells. I thought those were kitty ears. No, he's like, thought, a, he's like a goat or I something. I thought it was like a really big tiger kitty. No, he's just adorable. But the artwork is absolutely adorable in this game. And as I spoke a little bit about the graphic design earlier, I love the graphic design in this game. It's clear what the cards do. It's clear where you need to be looking. I think everything makes perfect sense. My only complaint is two of the colors of some of the actions at first glance, are hard to tell apart. It's going to be between like the red react and the pink review. Since they're small on the cards, when you're looking at them from the table, if you don't focus really hard, it can be easy to mistake one for the other. But most of the time when you see an action like that, you're going to read it fully. And so that's going to help you. And it's not like it's something that you have to act so quickly or anything that you'll miss it. But that is something that caught me off guard a couple times until I started to focus on like remembering which cards did the review ability, which is an end of game scoring. Now, because we've been in quarantine for the last, how many millennia now? A while. Last 53 years. Yep. Uh, Delt and I have only played this together, but we've played it four or five times in the last four week. Four times four now. Four times now. And, you know, it's been really fun. I've come about it with a different strategy each time, and Delton's won once and I've won three times. Yep. <laughs> but, I mean, there are multiple different ways that you can play it. I've tried rushing the game. I've tried, uh, so rushing the game as in like trying to get the adventurers to bid on my product quicker. I tried going on it for the long haul, kind of letting Delton start the bids, me just collecting weapons and whatnot, use my money that way. And so there's multiple different ways that you can go about it. And it's really fun. It is. Yes. Whenever you make an offer to an adventurer, since that's an action you do on your turn, it's going to be up to the players to actually push those turns on. So whenever you buy stock from the stock queue to put into your storeroom, which technically goes into your hand first. That's one thing I like, and I'll get to that in a minute. But when the cards on the table are bought and purchased, if they're all wiped out, they're done for that round. There's only five rounds in this game. So if you buy all the stock, all the fixtures, and all the staff, the only thing left to do after that point is to either use abilities on the cards that you have or make an offer. So Haley likes to rush and make offers very, very fast. But I like to take my time using abilities, buying new cards to use their abilities, and kind of plan. So she directly is like against my strategy. So she gets a lot early and I tend to like catch up at the late part of that turn, depending on how many adventurers come out and how much, like how much we value those adventurers to make offers to. Because the only way you get money is by selling to adventurers. If you have no money and you can't buy anything and you have no use actions you want to use, 
you kind of have to just make an offer to hope to win it to get money. So Haley does. She likes to rush it. But I do like that the players set a bit of that pace. So depending on who all you're playing with, the game could take a few different forms. I'm excited to play it with three and four players to see how it goes. Oh, definitely. I really think that Allison would like this game. Plus, it's cute. I think so. I think she'd like it. So I know I called this game a deck builder, and I did call it a deck builder, but I do want to definitely point out that this game does things differently. To me, especially. Haley doesn't quite see it the same, and I'll let her explain her point. But to me, this game does things differently than what deck builders normally do. And in that, there are two big examples for me. One big example is when you purchase a card that's going to go into your hand. Normally in a deck builder, it goes into the discard pile. You play your hand out, do everything. Everything goes in the discard pile and you draw a new hand. In this game, when you buy a new card, you put it straight to your hand. And it's immediately usable that turn to either use its action or to use it as part of the offer when you're selling to adventurers. So that's one of the big things that I really enjoy that this game has done kind of differently because you don't have to wait to utilize cards you're excited for. You can use them right there. If you're like, bam, I really want that ability. Ooh, I was able to buy it. You don't have to wait till you shuffle it back around. You get to play it then. There's that instant gratification of that, and I enjoy that a lot. The other thing this game does differently is this game, unlike most deck builders, like I said, you don't just dump your hand every turn. Most deck builder games, you play your hand out, you basically lay it on the table, do everything that you can do, you know, make your decisions there, and then you discard it and draw new. This game, since you're saving cards to offer or using them to use abilities, or sometimes you can use an ability to remove cards from your hand to try to get new ones, it gives you a lot more choices to make each turn every time it comes back to you in the round. You really have to decide, how important is this card right now? Do I want to offer with it? Or am I going to use this ability on it? And I feel like that decision space is improved upon most deck builders because it's a little bit of a slower pace. And I'm not going to say like I disagree with you, Del. Um, you said that um, Haley might disagree. It's not that I disagree with you that it's, it's different. I just think it's, it's enough of a deck builder that if you played a deck builder, you're, it's going to click for you. Like I don't see this as a completely different game than that. It's still a deck builder. It just has some extra elements in it. And so like you said, the um, multi-use cards, the how many times you draw draw your hand up is different than a lot of deck builders, but it's still a deck builder. So if you're familiar with the concept, you're going to be familiar with this game quickly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I see that. And that is something for sure is that, you know, deck builders have been around forever and we'll get to more on those in a minute. But Adventure Mart, it is going to feel similar. You know what deck building is. You're going to understand how Adventure Mart plays for the most part aside from the things that it does differently. So it is going to feel familiar in that space. I just really like the approach that they took in, to me, doing something I haven't seen yet. Like, I have not seen a deck builder do an offer or bidding system based on that. I don't know that I've seen a deck builder where when you purchase cards, they go to your hand. And I really like all of those things about this game because it brings something I, I haven't seen in that genre, in that mechanic as a main thing. You know what I mean? So I really enjoy that about this. One of the things I do want to say as well is there are a couple cards that are quote unquote mean cards. Some that when you're making an offer, somebody can use it and says, make your opponent get rid of their highest quality item from their offer. That could mean you're going to lose bidding on that adventurer. I should say, uh, which I think it's an obvious thing, but if I bid five and Haley bid six and she wins, my cards go back to my hand. I don't lose those, but she will lose hers because she is selling them to that adventurer. So if you lose an offer in the beginning, you can still have now, you'll have more cards than your opponent to offer on another adventurer. Which you can kind of use to your advantage because if it's a card that you really are lukewarm about, but you know that the other players want, you can kind of drive up the cost too in bidding. Oh, you really can. And that's going to give you an advantage later in the turn. Make Delton spend like four of his cards and because I know he wants it and then I get all mine back. <laughs> it's definitely a big thing. And that's why, and it's something else about this game I like, but how I said that it's a little slower. You only draw a new hand five times in this game for each new round. The only time you draw anything else or shuffle even is when you have cards that are making you draw from your deck. And then obviously when your deck's out, you have to shuffle your discard. So I think what? At most, we probably have shuffled. I think the last game was my most. And I wouldn't say I did it more than 10 times, probably. Oh, less than that. If not, Way less if than not that. like eight. Oh, <laughs> so I you 
I, yeah. I honestly think that I only shuffled maybe four or five times. I did more than you, but that's because I kept drawing my cards with the cards I had out. Yeah. I had the little stock rat, which I love because it lets you just draw two off the top. I think that's a great card. But what I like about it is being that you're drawing cards so slowly and you're not recycling as much, you're putting stuff in your hand, there's something about it that making these decisions, it feels more impactful that way. And like when you rush and... Um, when you rush and take an adventurer and you bait me into using my cards or something like that, like you start an offer, you bait me into cranking up the cost, I buy it, you keep all your cards, it makes card draw like an essential part of my game plan now because I have to get cards back to hand or I have to have the money to purchase new ones. There's just something about that to me that it feels so different and I really appreciate the different outlook on the game, on the mechanic of deck building. I just find that to be very entertaining. It's a very refreshing game. It really is. It's refreshing in the genre itself. And it's cute. It's very cute. But yeah, the mean cards. One more thing I want to say about the mean cards. I'm trying to make sure we hit everything because, as I said, this is a review copy, so I want to get all my thoughts out. The mean cards, generally, you have to banish them from the game after one use. I really like that because that means one person is not constantly uh, like punishing everybody else or doing things against everyone without spending money to do it. I really like that because if you were constantly saying, nope, like the one guy who says for any of these three effects, just cancel it. If you could just do that for an effect and then spend money or have some kind of little combo, it really would be painful to play against. But being that it's one time and he's out, unless they buy another one, I like that a lot. I see the guy's like the mob boss. Basically. Like he just sabotages. And so like you don't have a grocery store at that point. You have like <laughs> a, a front for an olive oil company. Exactly. <laughs> I think that's true. I guess the one other thing I'll say before we move past this to the topic, I know we've talked about this game a lot. Uh, there are daily bulletins every round in this game. So there's five rounds. Beginning of each round, whoever has the initiative token, which is gained by starting a, an offer to an adventurer, when you start that sale, they read the daily bulletin every new round, and that daily bulletin is going to do something for everyone. It's either going to make every adventurer that's in the offer, they're going to also be able to take cards in the blue color now. Or... Every single adventurer has one more money that they're willing to spend, or there's more cards for you to buy for your store out on the table, things like that. At the end of a round, when all the adventurers are gone, the person who has had the least traffic, which means the total gold value of the adventurers you've sold to, if you have the lowest, you get to get a free card from basically it's between two and six cards, depending on what's been purchased, or three coin. So that is a kind of nice catch-up mechanic. So if you're really behind and you just want some money, you're going to get some or you're going to get a card that can help you. So I do also really like that being included. I think we've exhaustively covered pretty much everything I have thoughts about in this game. We've exhausted all of our resources. We've exhausted all of our resources. I, I think you said just one more thing like three times. I probably did, but <laughs> I really wanted to get out everything about this game I've enjoyed, and it's because I've enjoyed it so much. We really have. Like I, I want, After we do this review, uh, I really want to play it again tonight. So that is, if anything, I, Hub Games, thank you again for seeing this, this review copy. Thank you. Because... This game is fantastic. I, it's going to come down to that. I've talked a lot about it in this review. However, the game is fantastic. The reason I know it's a good game is that even though I've been beaten three out of four times, every time we play it, I have fun, and I keep going, you know, I want to play that again. That's something that when you've played a game four times in a week, it's a game that I keep wanting to play, and I want to go back and try a different combo, go back and hope this card comes up so I can test it out. And I think that that says more than anything about it is that I keep wanting to play it to try different things and to just get more into the game. And I think it's just great. Same here. Seconded. I really do. It's a welcome, welcome addition. I think I've said enough about the game directly. Let's move to the topic to continue the discussion of deck builders. But first, let's have another beer. So before we talk about deck builders, which means we'll mention this game some more, we are going to crack into the second beer of the episode. This beer is from Sky Dance Brewing Co., which is local here in Oklahoma City. And this is the Mosquito Hawk Amber Ale. It says malty, balanced, and smooth. It is 5.9% alcohol by volume. I'm going to read the text on the can that I didn't see until just now. It's kind of hard to read because it's black on dark blue. To the dismay of our founder, the Crane Crake? Would you like some help? Yeah, I can't read that. We read that? It's really difficult to read. The can's perspiring as well, which makes it difficult. Oh. 
to the dismay of our founder, a crane fly cock a mosquito hawk is H A W. I can't read it either. Found its way into the fermentation vessel of our very first homebrew batch of this amber ale. Fears of an infection aside, the beer tasted great. The first batch went on to win two medals in a national competition. In honor of that first crane fly sacrificing itself to a bigger cause, we present to you the Mosquito Hawk Amber Ale. That's pretty great. That's awesome. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's yeah, hilarious. Mosquito Hawk. Yep, Mosquito Hawk. Thank you for reading that because I cannot read that. That's tough. Old man, take a look at my life. No. I'm a lot like you. That should be like... Rule number one in graphic design. Don't put black on dark blue if you want it to be text and readable. In their defense, it was dark blue on light blue. Well, it looks like it's black, okay? Oh, man, look at my life. From what I read on the website, this is Oklahoma's first Native American-owned brewery. We picked this up at Bacchus last weekend. Bacchus is a liquor store in North Oklahoma City that has all the great beers and a giant refrigerator that you walk into that i froze my ass off in it's freezing in there and to your other point it's very cool if they are the first native american owned brewery in oklahoma i think that's very very good but this has a nice amber color to it it is a little bit hazy you can't really see through it nice and dark it smells really sweet you smell the malt it's just Mm -hmm. very very malty on the nose exactly what you think of a malty beer it's got a much more robust Mm -hmm. roasty Toasty and roasty. Toasty and roasty taste versus that last beer we had, which was very like light and crisp. This has a sweetness, but it's different than that orange sweetness. It's that malty. It's like, you know what firewood smells like? Mm-hmm. Like, I know that if you were to actually chew firewood, it would taste like dirt. This reminds you of it? But this tastes like what firewood smells like. I could see that. I could see that. It's just, it's really good. It's a very solid amber. I don't see anything wrong with it at all. It's pretty simple. It's nothing like, you know, over the top crazy on any sense, but it's just so solid. It's very good. To the mosquito. Mosquito. Oh, and our clink for the game. <gasps> clink, 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 clink. clink, clink. Uh. While we're enjoying this delectable beverage, do you want to give a shout out to our Patreon backers? So I want to give a shout out to our Patreon backers. That is Allison, Alan, Jesse, Catherine, and Cliff. Thank you all for backing us on Patreon at the level in which you get shout out on the podcast. And thank you to all of you for helping support us and continue us improving our product. You're amazing and you're amazing and you're amazing and you're amazing and you're amazing. That's basically it. That's basically it. So let's move to the topic today, which is going to be talking about deck building as a mechanic in games and also a genre. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. It's a deck in a box. It is a deck in a box. Multiple boxes. So deck building, as we've been talking about, Adventure Mart is a deck building game. Something I didn't say early on, and I probably should have, is that if you have not played a deck builder, they've been around for quite a while. They were initially created by Donald X. Vaccarino, is the designer's name, of Dominion. Dominion is by far the biggest, most expanded upon, most well-known deck building game. They sell it in Target. They sell it in Target now. It's very, very popular. In a deck building game, you start with a small deck of cards. I kind of breezed past this for the review, and I probably shouldn't have. You start with a small deck of cards, and you'll use those cards to buy more to put into your hand. Uh, What happens is you take your hand of cards, you play it, you make the purchases with the money those cards are going to give you, put them in your discard and draw a new hand and you'll do the same thing over and over and over again, buying cards that let you take more actions or buy more cards or sometimes attack your opponents until you can spend money or whatever the game determines is your like uh, victory condition. In Dominion, you're buying cards that are worth points. You don't want to buy them too early because you'll fill your deck with junk you can't use, but you have to have them to have points for the end of the game. And this mechanic has been expanded and expounded upon greatly throughout board game history. I have a list here from Board Game Geek. I pulled up my games I personally own that take the mechanic of deck building and either change it into something super completely different or utilize a little bit of it in their games. So the games on this list that are the most definitive as a deck builder is not only not only the mechanic but it's the game itself. In the same way, Yahtzee is the game about dice rolling, right? 
Dominion is the game about deck building, as is Tanto Quare. That's the very, you know, from Japan anime games, the one Haley's not a big fan of, anime boobs. The one I've never lost at. That's also true. So that one is big. Uh, then, I guess I've already talked about Dominion. If you want to attack your opponent and have some fun little combo things, Star Realms is a deck building game where you are playing two space factions or whatever, and you buy these different cards and attack each other. We've played Ascension, which is essentially the same thing. Those are games that are all deck building as a game. And Paperback. Paperback is a deck builder, but it's also a word game, which kind of starts to throw a change in there. And Paperback and Hardback are some of our favorites because it's the only word games I can stand to play with Haley. It is Scrabble meets deck builder meets story time. It really, it really is, but I like it because it's so much more random and you can make any size of words and buy new letters to use. I don't know. There's something about that game that I absolutely love. And I think we've talked about it on the podcast yeah. before. Then you have a couple games that have taken deck building and used it as a piece of its mechanics. So Great Western Trail, you're buying cattle. Those cattle work in a functioning deck that's sort of like deck building for you to sell when you go to Kansas City. The same thing for Mombasa and Blackout Hong Kong. Mombasa, I'm not sure exactly how it works. It's kind of this weird, limited interesting mechanic with cards, and I believe Blackout Hong Kong follows that. Then you've got some games that have taken deck building and added a board with things to do. So Clank is a deck building game where you're trying to go deep into this dungeon and grab some gold and get out. So you have now taken deck building and used it where instead of buying cards off the table, which you are doing, you're also fueling running through this map on the board and trying to get farther and further in and then get out before the dragon wakes up and kills everyone. So that's kind of a big change. You have trains that does sort of the same thing. You're using your deck to build train routes on a board. But then you have a couple games that have taken deck building and completely changed it, removed the card factor, and turned it into what they call a bag builder. Like Quacks. Quacks of Quedlinburg and Altiplano are the two we own. There's also Orleone that I do not own yet. But those ones make it where instead of buying these cards and shuffling them, you're putting things in a bag and drawing from that. See, this is where the, the title comes into play when it comes to games. Mm -hmm. The main reason I wanted to play Quacks of Quedlinburg was because I thought it was a game about ducks. Not, I was, not crazy doctors. I was, I was pulled in by like, oh, it's a duck game. <laughs> like, if you had told me it's about like quack doctors, I would have been like, uh, sounds okay. But Delton said, we won't play Quacks of Quedlinburg at TokenCon. I was like, ducks, okay. And then we sat down to play. I was like, there's no ducks, but then I loved it. So that, yeah. my friends, is where you should put a lot, you should put a lot of your money into a, title creation for your game a lot of your money a lot of your time totally i should say i used to own thunderstone thunderstone advance which was another deck building game and the dc deck builder and the lord of the rings deck builder all of those those ones from cryptozoic work the and same. the marvel deck builder we got that for a wedding no that was dc the marvel one is marvel legendary we have not played that ah okay never mind yeah so there's a lot of deck builders out there it's a popular mechanic because it's so much fun what is so much <laughs> fun about it popular mechanic Oh, that's a magazine, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, there you go. I was like, wait, what is that? I know that. I recognize ah. it. Something about deck building that's so much fun is the fact that you're crafting something on the go. Unlike a regular standard card game, you're not going in with a deck already built. You are building it as you play the game and trying to make these combos, string these plays together, find ways to set up for awesome turns. And that's something that we find is very common in this uh, mechanic that's used throughout games. So, for example, in Adventure Mar, you can choose if you want to uh, stock up on staff or change out your staff every once in a while. You can choose if you want to put your money towards uh, lots of quick hitters, lots of small value things to basically up the bidding slowly. You can spend all of your money on some big cards that are going to totally wreck the, the sale, but you're only buying one card versus three or four. So there's lots of different ways that you can craft your deck. And the same thing with, with paperback. You can draft whatever letters that you want. You can draft a lot of vowels. You can draft a lot of consonants. You can draft the letter X. Very rarely are you going to use that letter X, but by God, when you use it, it's going to give you some money. Just for the word snacks. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Excel. Ex hey, there you go. Microsoft Excel. Oh, okay. Well, I don't like that one as much. <laughs> but yes, so all of these games have had deck building mechanics. It's something that's super popular, but Adventure Mart is the next step. That is the key of what I've tried to get through this whole episode so far, is I feel like Adventure Mart does the next thing. It presents you with 
more choices by the cards going in your hand. This is literally the first deck builder I've ever played where the card you purchase goes straight to your hand every time when it comes to stock cards, not, you know, the fixtures and the staff go out in front of you. But that's a big thing for me because that means I have a combo if I can buy that. Ooh, I bought it. Now I can do the combo my next turn. That's really a lot of fun. And so I think that that's one of the things that I find really intriguing about this game. But it is, deck building is so much fun. And when I say combos, that is part of what makes deck building so rewarding, I think. Now, no pun included, on YouTube, I highly recommend their channel. They did an entire video about combos, why they love combos, focused on deck building. More importantly, it was more of a review of the game Fort, which is coming out from later games. And in that, they did have a you know picture of Adventure Mart as well as some other deck building games because there's a lot we haven't played. Wait, we played Tyrants of the Underdark with Gates at Token Con, which was a deck building with area control when you put out the little people. You remember that? Yes, I do. It just clicked in my brain. Tyrants of the Underdark. We also played that one. But there's something about playing these card games where you play a card. So my favorite thing I had is on my turn, I would use my stock rat. He would draw me two cards from my deck. When it comes back to me, I had another card that said, at the beginning of your turn, it was a react ability, which means I don't have to use my turn for it. At the beginning of your turn, you can flip this to basically make your stock rat usable again. Then I would use my stock rat to draw two more cards. So then I would have drawn four cards in two turns, meaning I had a buttload of cards in hand for me to be able to offer to the adventurers. That's a very, very small little system, but by golly, when I got it running and it worked, it was fantastic. The same thing with when I had, was it a, I can't remember if it was a discount coin or what it was, but I was able to look at the top card of a deck and then I was able to do something to draw that card, hoping it matched the card I banished and then I could keep it. And so I was able to like make this little play and upgrade a card for free, which means free points at the end of the game. And it's just really neat that this one includes those kinds of uh, mechanics and combos and all deck builders have that, but Adventure Mart's I guess it's not that they're few and far between. They're more special when you set them up versus something like Dominion where you're like, all right, I get six different buys. I'm going to chain all these together. It starts to become not overwhelming, but I think for, for you've seen it so newer much. players to board gaming, it can get overwhelming. Not that yes. new players can't yes, yes, get yes. it, but it's a lot more like Adventure Mart. I could see us uh, introducing Adventure Mart to like my sister. My sister's a very smart individual. She just doesn't play a lot of board games. Yeah. And so I could see us introducing this to her. Oh, for sure. It's an easy enough game to play. I, something I didn't mention in the beginning, it does have a simplified setup for your first game where you take out some of the more complicated, I say complicated, more advanced mechanics, and you just play with the basics. And that way you learn how the game flows and plays and feels, and you learn at least one of every ability. And then you can play the full game, which I do highly recommend doing it that way. But yeah, it's just very fun. I think it's going to be good to introduce to people. But Deck building does. Those combos are great. And in a game like this, the combos are small and they take a second to set up and they don't last forever like a game like Dominion. So each game approaches it differently, but I think that's what makes deck builders so much fun. It really does. I mean, that's why Magic the Gathering is so much fun, right? When you have those turns that you just go off and you're like, wow, look at all the stuff I just did. Wow, that's so cool. Getting to do that a lot is what makes deck builders awesome. And you draw your cards. Big whammy, big whammy, big whammy. Or sorry. <laughs> no whammies, no, no whammies. No whammies, no whammies, whammies. Yeah, big money. <laughs> big money, there you go. Big money, there no is. whammies. I think that covers deck builders for the most part. Hopefully you have a better idea about them and how they've kind of changed and altered a little bit over time through some of these games. If you want a good place to start, honestly, Adventure Mart, I think is a great place to start with deck builders. Star Realms is also a very simple two-player only. It's you know really cheap and affordable. And then Paperback is one that, if you like word games, Paperback is a super, super solid deck builder. I just want to point out, like, I, I'm always surprised, but then again, I'm not surprised Never Delton just, like, rattles off uh, who has contributed to what games or whatnot, like Delton talking about uh, the guy who did... Donald X. Vaccarino. Like, just knowing who did Dominion. And here's something that happened after last episode, uh... Delton was trying to give me directions on where to put a board game back. And he said, it's by this game. And I was like, I said, it's by time stories. And then he's like, he, and I was like, okay, I'm looking for it. He goes, it's the white one. I go, okay, it doesn't really help me right now. I'm trying to, I know what it looks like. I'm trying to put this game away. And finally I found the spot and Delton's making fun of me because I didn't know that time stories was white or whatnot. Yeah. And so I said, okay, turn around. I said, what color is this game? And he says, it's this color, this color, this color, this color, this color. Damn it. 
Okay, what color is this game? This color, this color, this color, this color, this color. <laughs> damn it. What color is this game? This color, this color, this color, this color, this color. Like, damn it. Like, he, every single game I point, I point out some obscure games that we have not touched in like seven years. Yep. And by God, he knew exactly what was on the box cover. I'm like, I, I can tell you that Time Stories is white. I know that Twilight Struggle has red, white, and blue and like a fellow walking on it. And like the quacks has the little quacks guys. But I could not tell you what like the base colors of the spines are. Yeah, it's uh, it's a problem, but you have to think. I sit here and look at these shelves a lot. You just like turn your chair and just like board games. Just like admire it like a fine piece of art. More than you know. Like more than a this Gust- is all fine art, okay? It's like this is the Gustav Klimt of the board game <laughs> industry. <laughs> I have a Klimt. I have a Monet. I have a Manet. Have some mayonnaise in the fridge. Jesus. Sorry, I had to. I had to go there. But yes, so hopefully that gives you a good idea on deck builders. They're one of my favorite personal genres, my favorite mechanics to put in games. And I highly recommend if you have not played one to play one. And if you have played them and like them, get Adventure Mark because I think it's uh, it's leading us toward the next area of uh, utilizing deck building. I think. So to finish this episode out, we'll go to the question. And now join us. For a Malt House Games podcast special, bite size question. If you had your own personal adventure mart to sell things to adventurers, what would you mainly, not saying only, but mainly stock in your adventure mart? I would mainly cater to mages. So I want to sell some potions. I want to sell some crystals. Basically, I am I am selling to every like Edmund mom, like the essential oils and the crystals is what we're gonna be selling. You've got books about the power of the earth and yes, all it's that. like basically my store's gonna be earthbound. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but actually the stuff is legit and, and works <laughs> because they're mages, and of course it does, right? Yeah. So I think my adventure mart would be when I think of adventurers going into dungeons and going on quests. What I want to do, this is one of my favorite things, is I want to sit back and I want to pick people off from a distance. So the rangers in this game, the green, that is where I would live. It'd be bows and arrows. It'd be traps. It would be shoes to help you sneak even quieter so you don't get seen. Some kind of potion you take to make you be able to see even further ahead so you can shoot these arrows from a further distance back or something. That's what I would do. I would basically have a bow store and some other stuff. It's basically like the gun range of Western Oklahoma, but like magical. Yes, it is the (laughs) high fantasy gun range, which is just like every once in a while I'll have a crossbow in there. And that's the closest to a modern gun range you probably get. It's like the semi-automatic. It's probably slower, it's honestly, than a normal bow, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But I think that that's my answer. So earthbound in a gun range. Earthbound in a gun range. So I think that's going to wrap up this episode. Thank you again to Hub Games for sending us this review copy of Adventure Mart. We really, really enjoyed Ven- Adventure Mart. I highly recommend picking it up. You can go to Hub Games website i sadly can't think of what the website is right now but Haley's gonna look it up to tell you go to their website purchase this game along with holding on the troubled life of billy kerr which was one of our favorite probably our favorite cooperative game and i think it was the game of our year 2018 because i think that was the year it came out it is we are hubgames.com i should have known that because that's their social media tag also follow them on social media <laughs> Thank you again for tuning in and listening. Thank you again to our Patreon backers. If you have any questions for us, any comments or anything of that sort, send us an email, contact at malthousegames.com. If there's a game you want us to look at, a topic you want us to cover, or a question you want us to answer on the show, send us to that email as well. You can also find us on all social media at Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can find me personally at Delton Brack, D-E-L-T-O-N-B-R-A-C-K. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-K. That is at Squirrely Geek. I should say, if you want to see coming up in the future, we will be doing a review video for Adventure Mart. So if you're more of a visual person and want to get your eyes on it, keep your eyes peeled. That is coming in the near future. But I think that's going to cover everything. So until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Bye.